Hello, my friends, and welcome to Postscript. It's so nice to have you with us here on a Thursday night. Uh, we're coming to you from the Arlington Institute here in Berkeley Springs, West Virginia. And it's been a nice fall day here. Tonight, we've got a special guest who I've met um, at a conference in Las Vegas. And what we're going to do is uh, talk a little bit about alternative ideas about where the world's going. And uh, Brooks Agnew, nice to have you with us. Thanks for coming to be on Postscript. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Sure. Brooks, uh, you're an interesting guy. You've done a lot of uh, fascinating things. You're kind of an engineer by uh, profession and have worked your way through all kinds of industrial and manufacturing kind of things. But uh, what you've also done that's really quite fascinating and interesting and I've, is, is written a whole series of books. And your books, uh, interestingly enough, are called Birth, and it's not uh, B-I-R-T-H, but B-E-A-R-T-H, and they are essentially uh, novels about some really basic structural ideas about where the world is right now and where the world is going. And so maybe you can, for those of our viewers who are not familiar with your work, maybe you can just set it up a little bit and give us a overview of the general idea about your your books sure well my my career has been uh basically centered around high altitude engineering that is to say uh looking at systemic operations for the fortune 100 uh they want to launch a new product line or they want to break into a new market uh they know how to do what they do but not what they don't know how to do so they bring in somebody who knows how to put the systems together so they don't make so many mistakes in, in a launch. And I've, I've gotten pretty good at it. So what it allowed me to do is to develop a systemic way of thinking about the forces that are at work in the world today. And so what I wanted to do was create a one book, actually, that explained the phenomenon, actually, that I noticed in traveling the world that many ancient peoples believed and really spent a significant part of their gross national, national product expressing that belief that earth is something of a living thing, that it has a consciousness, that it, that it uh, blesses them or curses them, depending on whether they're behaving themselves or not. Mm -hmm. And this, uh, you know, is uh, an ancient thought, but it makes a lot of sense. And you look at the, some of the fantastic uh, wonders of the world that have been built to express that. And it, you really realize that they didn't treat this lightly. So, I decided to look at this from a modern point of view. What if the earth really was a living thing, a quasi living thing, that it did protect itself against toxins, that it did uh, bring forth spontaneous life, that it did have a kind of symbiotic relationship with the other consciousness on the planet, which the main consciousness signal is humans. And as I went through history, I realized that as humans became uh, high population on the planet, uh, sometimes they would become more wicked than good. And Earth, strangely enough, would have these allergic reactions to mankind. Wow. It would have a tidal wave or an earthquake or a, a freak uh, ice age or something. And the you know, race of mankind would be spanked back down to a few tribes and to start over again. But the last 300 years, man grew too fast. It learned to fly, it learned to burn oil, it learned to generate electricity, go into space, and it grew too fast for Earth to respond. So here we are, 8 billion uh, souls strong, a huge consciousness signal. About half of us are wicked, half of us are good, and the Earth can't decide whether to destroy us <laughs> or whether to release its bounty to us. So it decides to split back into its original paradisaical form, a spirit earth and a temporal earth as described in the book of Genesis. Well, how do you approach that from a systemic point of view, from a sci-fi point of view? How do you present that to a modern audience that you know has a very uh, uh, finely tuned bullshit detector uh, to really make sense and really uh, make people think that this is not a Marvel comic story, this is something that really could happen. And if you look in pretty much all of the scriptures, or at least extra scriptural 
a thought, there is this idea of a rapture that that somehow God is going to step in. He's going to snatch all the good people off the earth and lay waste to everything else. <laughs> Again, it's it's ex- yep. scriptural, yeah. but there are a lot of people that believe this. Yeah, sure. So I I wove the two systems. Some, some of them run our government. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I wove these two systems together and created a plausible, unsolvable problem that mankind has created this stratagem, this this uh, division, I call it a grand division, between the souls of mankind, some wicked, some good, and uh, Earth is going to divide and choose which ones go on which world, and then the worlds are going to go to war with one another. So it's 1,100 pages of an absolute white-knuckle ride. All of the science is real. All of the interpersonal relationships and the losses and the gains and, of course, all the subplots that go in normal movies are there, but it has an engineer's twist to it. So all the details about flying and racing and fighting and everything is real in the book. And it becomes sort of like Tom Clancy meets uh, Christopher Nolan. <laughs> it's uh, it's fascinating reading. And I've got, uh, I don't know, four, four, if not five of your books now. And uh, I've very much enjoyed them. So, so tell me this. So after having written st- the, at least the first one, and, and you know, and maybe the second or the third one, how uh, how close do you, are you getting any feedback that suggests that uh, oh. you're on track, or is uh... wow? Uh, of course, all the books have been up and down as far as bestsellers and not so bestsellers on Amazon. It depends on what marketing is doing what. But I finished the first book, and it was. It was a full-on chase scene from beginning to end. So I went on national radio, I interviewed, it, it sold, I don't know, 15, 18,000 copies, something like that. And then they said, so when's the next one coming out? I said, oh, I'll, I'll work on it. It'll be ready in a couple of years or whatever. That's not what happened. That book woke me up the next morning and I started writing on volume two. Long story short, 18 months, all three volumes were done. It was the wildest ride I've ever been on my hands ached from riding so much, but it was, it was a journey for me. It was just pulling me through it. And the fans were writing me and saying that they're learning how to deal with family death through the hope that the books give them that there really is an afterlife, that there really is a purpose to life, that there really is more to, mortality than what they have been taught right well i mean how else have you gotten feedback that suggests have you got any kind of external kind of indications that say that the basic plot of your stories are on track or close to being on track or what kind of how does that look to you well of course historically you could go back and see lots of examples of earth doing pretty freaky stuff to really you know if we're talking about the spanish armada sailing into the english channel and the queen saying no no don't worry about it don't don't put your navy out don't put him in danger everything will be all right and sure enough this freak storm comes up and sinks the spanish armada and they're still speaking english today yeah when they had more than enough navy to wipe the english out and then current events that are happening. Uh, there was an assault uh, from, let's just call it, uh, not Israel, on Israel. They launched a bunch of rockets, and the Iron Dome wasn't in place yet. And this freak wind came up and blew all the rockets out into uh, the lake, into the into the canal. And they were the, they were just freaked out that Mother Nature would just kind of rise up and blow these rockets out of the sky, saving all these lives. And there are everyday events that happen with us, too. People call it, you know, being in tune with the spirit or the universe, or they use all kinds of logic to go with it. But the bottom line is that there is a power to human resonance, to being able to as Jesus said, have the faith of a mustard seed, which ain't much. But if you apply a mustard seed at exactly the right moment over and over and over again, 
you will create a resonant power that is quite powerful. Well, there's no doubt about it. I mean, that's the essence of kind of manifestation and the and the concept that uh, you talk about and many others talk about about this uh, kind of synergy, this uh, linkage between humans and the earth or in the larger reality. And and in fact, that uh, our own consciousness or the aggregate, our collective consciousness, in fact, generates uh, general uh, kind of conditions and the events that we see around us. Well, there are hypotheses out there that say uh, if you keep trying something over and over and over again, you're insane. If you put a picture on your refrigerator and walk by it every day and look at it, hoping that you'll have it, you're, you'll just drive yourself crazy. But there is something to be said about that energy being put out in, let's call it the future, because humans, let's face it, are the only creatures on this planet that can perceive time. And if you don't believe me, try to tell your dog about tomorrow. It just, yeah. it's not going to work. But the fact that we can put energy into the future, this clear vision of something into the future, means that we can transmit energy through time right. with our consciousness. And once that energy arrives in the future, it Im it immediately begins to emit its own signal. And it goes through time back to the right. present. So that means that things around us are sympathetically vibrating with the energy from that signal we put into the future. Now, if we just go back to the future and keep banging the gong over and over and over again, true, nothing will happen. But if we start putting energy into those things that are vibrating with the energy that we put into the future, magnificent things happen. And I found that after eight iterations, this addition uh, falls upon what we, what we call the golden mean, the 1.618 to 1, which is kind of this ratio of application of energy that creates matter from chaos. And so therefore, there are hypotheses that we actually can manifest our own future. And there's enough evidence to back up lots of experiments that it may actually be a sound theory. Well, there's guys like Neville Goddard who have just uh, essentially proven that and written, well, I don't know, 16, 30, maybe it's 18 books or something like that, that just uh, are very, very compelling. And more recently, Joe Dispenza, who's running around using a lot of the same kind of basic principles with many, many large uh, conferences and such uh, that are that is also showing and uh, bringing up examples uh, regularly about how people connect. And for my money, it's just the emergence kind of characteristics of a new human, uh, uh, one of what are likely to be a whole series of them that include telepathy and reading auras and any number of things that um, we all we see around us in many other places that people, individuals, uh, are able to do these kinds of things. And it's just this new uh, kind of uh, character or the cap set of suite of capabilities that are bubbling up in the system and they're going to come together here. Um, well, I wouldn't be surprised in the next decade, uh, at least, or start to, and uh, become a kind of a new human. And so what you're talking about is... Uh, uh, you know, in a sense, sounds like uh, uh, Dolores Cannon a little bit, if you are, mm -hmm. are familiar and know about her. And she talked about these kind of two uh, uh, dimensional worlds that were uh, coincidental, uh, uh, you know, in this kind of environment right now. And over time, they then split and go different kinds of ways. And so there is uh, clearly a new world that's going to come downstream or so that every indication says. And so uh, I found your uh, scenario and your suggestions really quite provocative. I appreciate that. I, I know Dolores or knew her pretty well. And the idea of the parallel universes that we actually exist in both at the same time and our consciousness can actually move between them is compelling the way I tried to approach it in birth is that it's the earth itself 
that is actually two phases of matter, higher vibrational matter, which we call spirit matter, lower vibrational matter, which we call temporal matter. And I kind of drew this straight from the scriptures. If you go into Genesis, there are actually two creations, one physical and one spiritual. And somehow Earth in this six day period, this six day process was merged yeah. as a spirit Earth and a temporal Earth. Well, if you think about temporal Earth, rock and metal Earth, there's a lot of space in the matter. It's sort of like a, sort of like a five gallon bucket full of glass marbles. It's full. You couldn't put another glass marble in it, but you can fill it with a couple gallons of water because there's a lot of space between the marbles. So the and look at us. I mean, we're sure protein and water and and some bone, but we are this animated flying gazelle inside of this physical body. So Earth is kind of the same way. And I'm not saying Earth is going to die, but Earth is going to sort of maybe uh, what you call transfigure. Yeah. And so when it says in a lot of the writings that the light shall shine and the darkness shall comprehend it not. Right. We're seeing that right now. We're seeing beings of light all over the world. And yet you don't see it on CNN or Fox or New York times because the darkness doesn't show you that world. Uh, no doubt. No doubt about it. The, uh, uh, I really have always enjoyed the kind of Dolores Cannon's kind of idea and take on all of this. Uh, but it's only one of a whole a variety of kind of ways uh, uh, that are popping up all over the place. I mean, I'm in, I'm impressed. I'm in the business of trying to look at a whole lot of stuff and read a lot of things. And the uh, variety, I, I, the, the notion that there would be this kind of continuation of the world as it is, or at least a familiar emergency, I mean, emergence of what would be uh, considered a familiar kind of environment is uh, seems to be kind of fallacious to me it just is uh... well yeah i mean the whole idea of what is familiar well if you look at mass media and be it news or movies or music or it, you know any other forms of entertainment it is by and large totally occupied with a somewhat unified vision of their future and it doesn't really gel with mine or nor a lot of the people that i associate with we have another future in mind but we don't have access to that ability to get our idea out there so that other people can also put their energy on it and make it manifest so we're competing against one another in kind of parallel worlds yeah. Yeah, the the we're convinced here, and we we're doing a lot of things here at the Arlington Institute to, to try to try to build a vision, an image, a model, even of a new world mm -hmm. to have an alternative, so that you've got a picture and you've got a mental image of uh, an alternative to the kind of dystopian direction that mm -hmm. uh, you know the technocracy and all are trying to take us to, and. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm, I, th that's one of the reasons why I find uh, found your books uh, is fascinating is because they start to break you outside of the uh, kind of the common mold of uh, thinking about and presuming that things at the most fundamental level are going to be the, <laughs> be the same and that uh, all, all we can do is work around the edges, you know, and try to make the government better, for instance, and such which is a, a real losing ideas as far well, as well you I see that that uh one of the things that i hint at in the book is there's a sect of of uh workers let's call them and their job is to memorize commit to memory certain holy writings mm -hmm. periodically like on a regular basis they go back and read those records again to see if the record changed because their memory is the one on the original timeline, like the Mandela effect. Right. If we realize that the timeline has shifted is when the written record changes. Mm. And so then they alert the world leaders, Hey, we've shifted. 
this was written this way. Now it's written this way. And, you know, I'm the original, not the written one that you see in the library that's 1,200 years old. So it's it's really a fascinating concept that Earth, that we are older than worlds and that we don't just live one mortal life. We live thousands of mortal lives and that we as a soul accumulate experience from each of these mortal lives until we overcome everything. Well, I don't know about it. I, I, <laughs> yes. I mean, uh, that's certainly uh, commonly suggested as the end point of all of this uh, kind of coming back to uh, the or original or to the source and, and, you know, this breathing out and breathing in and such. And, uh, um, <laughs> but yeah, General uh, Morley talks about that, that he's, He's the sort of the um, uh, antagonist in the books, and he's the one that's uh, leading the military forces against the, the good people of the world. And, and he says, you know, look, everything in the universe once came from darkness, and it's going to go back to darkness, and I'm comfortable with that. So he's he's got this, you know, experience that other people don't have, and he's accumulated thousands of lifetimes of darkness inside of him mm. so it is a totally different concept than uh than what people are normally used to seeing some demon coming to earth and you know stomping with his magic you know through the earth no we're talking about real mortal souls that are dark yeah well t tell me in, in in the context of all of this and, and of course you've gotten around and you speak a lot of different places what do you think uh, the next couple of three years looks like? Where do you think this is going? Uh, well, there are, of course, big forces at work. And the good news is that news travels at light speed now. We do have uh, media. We have TikTok. We have YouTube. We have Rumble. We have BitChute. We have all kinds of ways that people can, can communicate faster than the algorithms can keep up with them. It's like you know, a rumor travels from one end of town to the other quicker than you could drive from one. End. But now it travels around the world, you know, instantly. Right. So it is as though the people who really want to control the world, and for the life of me, I can't figure out why. I don't know why anyone would want to control the world and worry about whether we eat three times a day or what we think about. I I just don't get that. But any, at any rate, their forces are out there, the Davos crowd, the Schwabites, you know, whatever, you oh, will yeah. own nothing and you'll be happy kind of people while we own everything. Uh, right. I think their plans are not going as they expect. I think that what they thought they were going to do in taking over all of Europe and taking over the Middle East and taking over and scattering uh, Russia to the four winds, it's not working out for them. The people of the world are aware of their game now, both with money uh, becoming pretty much counterfeit. Uh, the value is not in currency. Value is in us. We're yeah. the headwaters of all the value. And now the people are becoming aware that they have control over that value. And we're seeing it. We're seeing it with Texas standing up to the federal government of uh, protecting its borders. We're seeing it with Alaska telling the federal government it's our oil and we will drill when we want and where we want and sell to whomever we want. We're seeing it with 13 counties in the eastern side of Oregon saying, that's it. We're done with Oregon. We're moving to Idaho. Yeah. We're seeing forces working now that we've never seen before on the earth people who love liberty really love liberty and people that don't understand that are trying to take it away from them i do fear that if liberty does leave the earth that it will never come back well that may well be uh, but uh, your trend your trends about <clears throat> moving uh exists even here on the east coast uh, the there are three counties. Uh, we're located in the uh, eastern, uh, in the panhandle, eastern panhandle of West Virginia. And there are three counties that are in the western end of Maryland who have all approached West Virginia and asked <laughs> uh, how they could uh, become part of West Virginia. And so, so the 
so the the idea is in is in the wind i mean it's all over the place and there are similar kind of things going on in many other kind of places i mean look at louisiana louisiana was so solid blue it wasn't funny and it, for 11 years it was totally controlled uh by uh, a blue city which is uh new orleans and and the state has broken away now they have a new governor they have a new secretary of state they have a new senator they have it's it's and speaker of the house i mean lots of things have gone louisiana's way in the last 90 days and look at west virginia you have nate kane running for congress up there fantastic guy a uh, former uh, fbi whistleblower uh went to war with the deep state and survived to tell about it and now he's running for congress a lot of things happening yeah there are there are some really good indications in there Plenty of kind of analysts and pundits, including guys like uh, Martin Armstrong and Cliff High and others who have uh, a, a lot of kind of technology that has, a, a, in some cases, in Marty Armstrong's case, have never been wrong for 40 years. And in Cliff High's case, uh, you know, has a really good you know, track record. I, I know Cliff. He does pretty well. I'd say he's a 75 percenter anyway. Yeah, I, I'd he's guess. Yeah. That's what I would guess as well. As well. And uh, both of those guys are saying that, that there is not going to be this reset or takeover or what you want to call it. It's not going to be successful. I don't think their plans are working out. No, as a matter They're of fact. also dangerous. It makes it dangerous because yeah. they get desperate and they do crazy things. Yeah, we've got a, just a couple of three minutes here left, but I'm interested. So Martin Armstrong says that uh, between 2025 and 2027, this is what his computers program has said for uh, 40 years. Between those two years, uh, those two dates, that there's going to be a global civil war. Uh, and after that, there's going to be the breakup of the United States. Does mm -hmm. that make sense to you? Well, I mean, the civil war is uh, takes many forms. Usually it's when uh, the people rebel against the government. Um, I think what is really happening here is it is more good against evil because it isn't really, uh, you know, 13 states are going to split off the United States. It's not uh, uh, federal troops are going to be sent into, uh, you know, New Mexico. It's not that kind of civil war. It's kind of a a uh, social civil war in the sense that there are people who want to be taken care of and there are people who want to do great things. And that is the grand division. That is the people that want to produce, that want to succeed, that do believe they can own a home and raise children uh, in the sex they were born with. That yeah, that the the basic idea here is a global civil war and and you're you're right i spent two months looking at that saying what in the world is a global civil war because most of them are conflict between two factions within a within a nation state right and uh what it turns out to be is that the idea that there's an uprising a general uprising of the people against the governments across the planet and it pivots on the whole idea of betrayal that they really feel like that, you know, there are a series of things have happened that got them to the place where they just said, enough, you guys have screwed us. We gave you our money. You gave us our time. We gave you our trust and you've taken advantage of us. And you can certainly see a whole lot of people on the streets all over Europe and other kind of places in the world who are essentially saying that in their own, in their own way. And, uh, it kind of looks, uh, you know, if you've got that scenario in the back of your mind, you can look across what's going on uh, across the world today and you can see that distinct possibility. Yeah, well, uh, there is an energy that that existence is of, by and for somebody. It's either of, by and for the people or it's of, by and yeah. for the people who are fortunate enough to be in right. government run the government and yeah. so if that's the civil war it will be quick and it will be uh efficient yeah well it'll be but uh, he says that it's over within two years and that's pretty pretty quick for a global yeah, i would say the initial conflict and then what we call the cleanup yeah. yes it'll be it would be over very fast like like french revolution fast yeah i think so well brooks Brooks Agnew, thanks very much for being with us here on Postscript. I really appreciate you taking your time out 
to come and chat with us a little bit. And uh, and I'd certainly recommend your books, uh, uh, Birth, B-E-A-R-T-H, uh, and our, as this common theme in the title. And they're fascinating and provocative kind of ideas. And, and they're all in audio. So if you're not a great reader, don't worry about it. I read him for you. And you can you can get them in audio. Well, that's, that's kind of the good deal about all of this is because there's a thing inside the book that says if you bought the book, you can call you you can get in contact with you, and you'll give you a link to where the the free download of the audio. And that's right. I, I listen to these when I drive on uh, on long road trips, and so it's a it's a real advantage to that. So uh, I would commend all of our uh, listeners to uh, to uh, hunt up. Uh, Brooks Agnew's books. Thanks, Brooks. Thank it's you. Very, very nice to have you with us. And uh, thank all of you who are uh, our viewers. We really appreciate it. And if you found this helpful, then please do the kind of algorithmic thing and kind of like and uh, subscribe and share this with other folks because uh, we'll be back and we do more. And you can find out a whole lot more about what we do at arlingtoninstitute.org. By the way, where can we find out more about what you do, uh, Brooks? Easy enough, brooksagnew.com. Everything is there. Books are there. Podcasts are there. My philosophy is there. You can read everything and, and inform yourself. Great. Thanks so much. Take care. Thank you.